Mark chapter 10. I'm going to go to verse 13. I will admit, I, I did put to start at verse 2, but it didn't have anything with what I wanted to talk about. But uh, there's a lot of uh, they, them, him, he, so I'm going to help you out. So you, you might want to listen rather than follow. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that Jesus might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to the children. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to the disciples, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. All right. I didn't put a lot of fanfare in it. There's been a lot of other talking about uh, things this morning, but today is World Communion Sunday. All right, World Communion Sunday. I don't know why last week's uh, picture is up there. Isn't that funny? Is the next slide different from this one? No. Let's just leave it there. There we are. We'll, we'll go with this. All right. <laughs> last week's picture. So today as we partake of the Holy uh, Sacrament of Holy Communion, we have, uh, are doing it today in a mindset that we are remembering that we don't do it alone. We're not the only church that does it. Okay? And I'm not saying because it's the first Sunday of the month and we always take communion on the first side of the month. First Sunday of the month. Just like the Christian church on 6th Street takes it every Sunday. No. I'm talking about all around the world there are churches doing this. But we do it all together and recognize World Communion Sunday as a Sunday whenever we take this representative meal and we share it, not for us alone. The communion liturgy is performed today in many more languages than we can count. And I'll admit that the bread's not going to look like ours or taste like ours in every church that's doing this. And the celebrants around the world will come in all kinds of colors and answer to a variety of titles and have a variety of theologies different or like ours. One thing we'll all have in common is we all have Christ. It's world communion. It's a world communion observance that's taking place in a diverse and a divided world today. And it's a world that actually needs has needs as real as bread. And it has hungers as deep as the ocean. Now a question often asked today, is communion primarily a spiritual event or a physical one? Which one is it? I could ask Ron. He's smarter than me. But I'm going to give you a break, Ron. I'm going to give you a break because I, I wrote this. All right? Cause I think it could be both. It could be both, spiritual and physical. Alright, let's let's be open to this. Y'all open to it? Everyone good? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. I'll think you're Pentecostal. Alright. Now we tend to lean spiritual, right? Okay, that it's a spiritual event. Yes, yes. Okay, good, good, good. We're all on the same track. Because sure there's there's bread and juice going to be shared, but it is the grace and the remembrance that really make it communion. Our task on Communion Day is to actually experience the presence of Christ. Isn't that it? Yeah. Okay. It's our task to transport ourselves onto a, a spiritual plane and commune with the one who actually set the table. We're to move beyond the mundane and to enjoy the sublime, right? All right, so I'm, I'm leading you down a path, and I'm going to take you in a different direction now because I'm not really sure that's what it is, all right? Because whenever I read, especially this story, I find that Jesus seems quite intent on making things and by making faith real, okay? He was grounded in reality, 
the reality of the world in which we live. He always talks in images of the kingdom of God and the metaphors that he used were of the earth, things we saw, things that were real. All right? He talked about seeds and pearls, light and darkness, sheep and coins, the stuff that we live with every day. Right? So in my mind, I think he sat at the table and took hold of the reality of bread and said, this is my body. This is me. I'm here. I'm as real as bread. And every time you pick up a loaf of bread, you'll be touching me. Every time you'll be holding me, you'll be claiming me. I'm here, right here in this world with you. That Jesus wanted people to be grounded, not floating around on some heavenly cloud somewhere. So then when his disciples tried to turn and talk to the reality of the kingdom of God, asking about seating arrangements and where their place cards would be placed at this great table that he would someday set for us, what's the seating arrangement? Jesus got exasperated with them and he says, this cup, this cup is my whole life. I'm as present as the clay it took to make this cup. I'm as alive as the bouquet of this wine, the fruit of the vine. I, I am that vine. He was trying to get his followers to live in the world, to pay attention to what was right in front of them. Okay? I think that was his trait. That was a predominant trait. He, he's issuing an invitation to pay attention. He was always pointing to the most unlikely things and the most unlikely people and asking his followers to see them. To really see them. Not to miss them. And as Mark reports in his gospel, people were bringing little kids to him in order that Jesus might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to these children. And when Jesus saw this, my Bible says he was indignant and said to his disciples, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And Jesus took the children up in his arms. He laid his hands on the children and blessed the children. This is the Jesus that we know and love best of all, isn't it? I believe it is. But we have to realize that this action by Jesus was a radical departure from normal behavior of the time. No one with any authority or power or standing in society in this period of history would even have time for children. It wasn't done. And yet, here's Jesus. Not only allowing children to be in his presence, but taking them up in his arms and blessing them. It was so embarrassing for the disciples. What's he doing? Come on, man, we've got people as I'm standing around here watching. What are you doing? <laughs> I think the disciples were scandalized by his behavior. And Jesus didn't care. What he cared about was blessing. He cared about touching and putting children on his lap because they were real people. Worthy of his attention and presence. He cared about welcoming. He cared about including. Do you hear me? He cared about making sure that everyone understood the value of those of whom he said, let them come. My Bible, uh, you know, kind of reads... Like Jesus got angry. My Bible actually says, uh, New Revised Standard Version says, indignant. 
Did anyone use the word indignant in a sentence this week? No, okay, I thought maybe I was the only one that didn't, but thank you for helping me out there. Patty uses it all the time, but it's normally when I do something. So, uh, I don't understand that. But no, she doesn't. So, I'll tell you what, the original word in Greek is a whole lot more harsh, but we're not going to get Greek for the week because I couldn't pronounce it. But what I'm trying to say is, I don't know if it was anger, but it was concrete. Jesus was being very concrete. Do you know what I mean by concrete? He was solid on this one foundational fact. Have you ever driven your vehicle into a piece of concrete? Anybody? I'm asking a question here. Anybody ever driven there? No? Really? Am I the only one? Okay, good. All right, so uh, it's immovable. It's something you will have to deal with. Jesus was concrete here. Concrete. He was saying, you're in the way. That's what he's telling the disciples who have th thought of themselves as bouncers of who could get in and who could get out of Jesus' presence. Jesus said, you're in the way. Not just of these kids, but of the very kingdom of God. I think this was one of those get behind me Satan moments. One of many... <laughs> disciples were missing something so fundamental that they had to be stopped. They had to hit a wall and deal with it. So Jesus was trying to help his hearers see something of the glory and the wonder of the kingdom of God. So he grabbed the nearest visual aid that he could think of children. Come and see. I think he could have said that. It would have worked. Come and see. See through these eyes the wonder of God's creation. Come and see the needs and the opportunities to serve. Come and see how we can live out the commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. And then he gathers up the kids. So that we could see that the best way to rid ourselves of doubts and fears and suspicions and animosity is by getting outside of ourselves long enough to bless a child. To talk to him. To listen to him. To experience the world through their eyes. But then, of course, he wanted to make sure they didn't miss the point. He wanted to be sure the disciples didn't miss it. And that... Through them, we won't miss it either. Because he said, to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. And actually, he didn't say belongs. The verb in Greek that our translation came from is not belongs. The verb here is, ready for it, is. That's the verb. Is. Should be written. For it is to such as these the kingdom of God is. Is. What he's saying is they got it. They get it. They are it. You want to embrace the kingdom? Embrace the child. Let them come, he says. That means that how we treat children and what we allow done to children or not done to children is what we do to the kingdom of God. And then in case we're still unclear, Jesus continues to drive his point home because he says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God has a little child will never enter it. Of course, we wonder what that means exactly, right? Yeah. We start spinning it in our head. And that's a question that's driven uh, biblical scholars uh, crazy for over 2,000 years. On the one hand, are we supposed to receive the kingdom of God as a child would receive the kingdom or as a child would receive anything? Okay. Or are we to receive the kingdom in a way that we would receive a child? Or as we receive a child? In other words, 
Is our ability to receive the kingdom dependent upon how we receive children into our midst? How we treat children or mistreat them as individuals and as a society that when our children suffer at the hands of adults or governments or religious leaders or parents, are we in danger of losing our grip on the kingdom of God? Maybe the heaviness of that last part <laughs> of thinking is why most take the first track that we're to receive children as uh, where we to receive the kingdom of God like a child would. But how do children receive things? How do we emulate them? I got books written on how we're supposed to receive the kingdom of God if you want to read them. Lots of ink has been spelled to answer that question. Words like innocence and purity or dependence or wonder, they're often used to help us grasp the attitude it takes to receive the kingdom. But, as I often do, I wondered about this. And I wondered if it's not about an attitude, but more about an action. Attitude's important, I'll give you that much. I don't mean to suggest that it isn't. Yet Jesus is being concrete here. And I have found in a very violent intersection uh, that you have to deal with concrete. Okay, You've got to stop and deal with it. I think Jesus is being concrete here. He is grounding us in the world of doing so maybe his point is more earthly than we tend to think. Maybe his point is more simpler. So let's, I think about it this way. How do children receive anything? And I find it uh, that they do it with both hands. Do it with both hands. That's how. Maybe that's how we're to receive the kingdom. Today is World Communion Sunday. But I don't think big. I think thinking big is hard. It makes you worry too much. I can't think about the entire world, all of them and all their stuff going on. I need to think a little closer to home. I can't think about all of the people who are partaking of communion today, all of their thoughts, theologies, hopes, dreams, concerns worries, doubts, and fears. I just wonder if we can receive the sacrament as a child would. Open hands, innocent, wondering about things, amazed. Just thinking about it as the wonderful treat that it is. So today, let us join our sisters and brothers around the world in 38 different Christian traditions in celebrating the gift of Christ in our midst. Can we just do that? Can we be that simple about it? Can we celebrate our freedom from sin by Christ's sacrifice for us? Because Christ does call to us today 